Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Times Talks at Cinema Cafe. Unfortunately, my Sundance colleague John is stuck in a snowstorm, so I'll be making the introduction for both the New York Times and Sundance tonight. So Times Talks is um, thrilled to be collaborating once again with Cinema Cafe uh, on a, a series of Times Talks um, over the next few days. Today, our guests need no real introduction, but uh, we have Gus Van Sant, the award-winning director, screenwriter, artist, and author, um, whose film, Don't Worry, He Won't Get Far on Foot, is in the festival and will be joined this afternoon by composer, singer, and songwriter, Danny Elfman, who wrote the score for the film. Uh, and moderating this afternoon's conversation is one of our favorite New York Times contributing writers, Logan Hill. So thank you so much for coming. Thanks, and at first I'll just tell you a little bit about the, the, the run of show today, because we're going to do something a little unusual, uh, which is great, and I think really special for everybody who's here. Um, it'll be a little weird if you're watching on the live stream, because the screen is going to black out at a few seconds for you guys, so apologies for that. But for no everybody here... No social media. <laughs> the no social media code is uh, because we're going to have some exclusive footage from the film which premiered last night, and we're going to have some exclusive audio of the score um, sometimes here we talk, we get into lots of big ideas. We're going to get pretty specific today and, and really talk about a couple of scenes and how these two guys who have worked together on so many films work together on, on their latest. Um, just as a reminder, uh, Promised Land, Restless, Milk, Goodwill Hunting, and one of my favorite films in the world to die for um, are just the, some of the films. I have, is that all of them? Is that, am I missing Psycho. Psycho? I'm missing Psycho. Promised Land? Mm. I got Promised Land. <laughs> um, but I thought we, you know, because you guys have been collaborating for so long, I'm interested in, in that process, you know, being at the heights of your fields, uh, how that negotiation works, how those discussions work on films. And I thought we might start with To Die For. What was it like, those first negotiations and getting to know each other? Well, it was through uh, um, my girlfriend at the time, knew Gus, and you contacted her. And she came to me and said, would you be interested in meeting Gus Van Sant? I was like, sure. So she kind of middleman, didn't she? Yeah, I think we had um, a friend in common, Carolyn Thompson. And uh, so yeah, I was assuming that Danny Elfman was out of reach for my uh, filmmaking style. And then I found out through Carolyn that he was actually really interested. So we um, concocted the To Die For project. Yeah. How did you feel each other out? I mean, how did you know that you were on the same page and we're going to work well together? Or did you not just not know? Is it always a gamble? Yeah, we didn't know. Yeah. I, that's the I thing about the business, I think, is like you never really know. What's no, going especially with, with music, you don't know until somebody's right in the middle of actually doing it and you're listening to stuff, you know, because you don't get a treatment version. Uh, if you're doing a writer, you know, you might get a treatment of a story and then you flesh it out to a full script. With the music, you're going on trust until the person's hired on the project writing music and you hear it and then if you hate it, you got a problem. Um, but at that point, early on with To Die For, you didn't really see being involved to the level as you became later because of your previous experiences where you were more yeah, I think I just hadn't had an experience, a, a more traditional um, scoring experience or also Danny's style was to basically um, you know, make sure that what he was working on was something that I was, simul you know, as well let in on and listening to. So I think the first thing that we did was Danny um, chose a couple of scenes um, and um, made a few different versions of ideas that he had that he wanted to carefully walk me through each version and show me, like, which version of the cue which, what was different about them, because sometimes they were similar, sometimes they were very different, but I was part, I was part of it, and I, <clears throat> I was, um, I remember saying, uh, why don't you just take the movie, make the score, and like, <laughs> I'll see you on the mixing stage. Yeah, it was like <laughs> old school, like, you know, Alfred Hitchcock would have done with Bernard Herrmann, it's like, yeah. okay, do your score, I'll see you on the other side. They would do that in the old days? Yeah. That's so all, all movies were made, really, back then. Uh, they didn't have demos, they didn't do demos. Um, so Hitchcock never got to hear his scores until it was a with the orchestras in the studio. Whoa. Yeah, 
And uh, so Gus was approaching so that's a little bit old school. That's what I was talking about. And I was <laughs> more from the school of, you know, the directors involved with every decision. And also because I, my style of writing is to look at a scene and come up with a number of options. I mean, unless it's real obvious, like it's a superhero and it's a villain's theme or something like It's okay. I think everybody knows it's going to be this kind of thing. But in a movie like To Die For, certainly in all the early Tim Burton films, um, there was nothing obvious that should go in any scene ever. It could be anything. So you look at stuff and you go, well, we can play it this way or we can play it this way. And then here's a, a crazy thing we could do. So I usually start with a couple of things that seem like could be this or this and then one, like, on the other hand, here's way from left field. And then let the director get pulled into it. Um, and, and to die for in particular, there's so many ways to go. It was almost like an unlimited ways to approach it. There was no obvious way to approach the dive. There was a desire to um, mix heavy metal, which the kids would be listening to, with a more traditional orchestra, orchestra which would be the voice of the filmmakers, I guess. Yeah, and we, and we did have a conversation about a band called Nail Bomb. So Gus played me some of this um, speed metal, and he said, I'd like this somehow to be incorporated. So I kind of pulled that into the actual score because I was listening to Nail Bomb and really digging it and going, okay, and I could do this, you know, and, and start having fun with that. So there was like this bit of a jumping off place of like, in Goodwill Hunting, it was like the other opposite. It was uh, um, Elliot Smith's guitar. And Gus knew up front that we, I want to use Elliot Smith. So there it was like, okay, I had, actually had these songs to listen to, to interface with. But those songs were actually going to be in the movie. Whereas with Nail Bomb, it was more just like the idea of Nail Bomb. It wasn't for sure any specific song was going to be in a certain... Maybe there was one scene. There's one cue when they see uh, <clears throat> Nicole's character walk right. by them in at yeah. school. Yeah, okay. So there was that. So I knew that there was that one piece in there. So that did give me something to hang on a little bit. Which and there's a little bit of a myth around this one. I was mentioning this earlier that, uh, that the, the film screens for the first test screenings with no score, and the story is so unusual, the tone of the movie is so hard to predict that it doesn't go terribly well <laughs> until the score is added and the, the cam premiere happens. You want to talk a little bit about like, sort of how much the score means to in, sort of setting expectations for the tone of that movie? I th I always thought that the score was just rigged in a very bad way. I, I I didn't really think of the music as as the cure for our ills. It was more that we th the studio seemed to be testing it as a romantic comedy, and that the peop and they weren't told they. Uh, this my story always is at um, we had a test. It, str it scored thirty two, which is very low. We had another test planned. A of after editing a little bit. My editor was so sure that the tests were being mishandled that he went to be indoctrinated. And he, he sort of cruised around uh, South Pasadena where the film was going to be testing and you know found the people with white coats and, and, and free tickets uh, to this test screening. And he got to ask them questions like, oh, what's this? You know, pretending he was a dentist and his wife was with him. Um, and they said, it's a movie you can, you know, like, see for free. And they said, what's it about? And they looked at their chart and said, oh, it's a romantic comedy. So who's in it? Nicole Kidman and Matt Dillon. And they said, who directed it? And they were like, looked through their pages and said, we don't, we don't know. And like, what it's about, what's it about? We don't know. It's just a romantic comedy. So I think that the people that went to see it were thinking of a romantic evening. And it was a, you know, about a woman who kills her husband. And... <laughs> So they probably didn't get laid, you know, and it, or weren't going to get laid. So that's when asked, like, how do you rate this film? They're like, very, very poor on the box. So that was my story. I mean, the, generally, because I've been through close to 100 previews. I've done a, over 100 films now. And uh, the more quirky the film, the harder it is to preview. And that's also... Uh, where the music makes the biggest difference. The, the odder the film, the more the music can lead you into how you're supposed to be feeling. In other words, 
it was very intentional in the beginning of the Die For. We wanted something really aggressive and kind of crazy to kind of say, this is the kind of film you're going to be getting in to see. This is not a romantic comedy. I mean, it was very much like when I had Beetlejuice before, which also tested horribly, so horribly, the movie almost got dropped. And, um, and they had in their temp kind of long, flying, gliding music over the beginning. And I said, let's do something from, that won't happen until 45 minutes in the movie. Let's put that right in the title up front so you know right in the beginning, oh, I get it. It's going to be like that. I may have to wait for that, but that's going to happen, that kind of craziness. So the, the odder the film, tone-wise, the more you can do with the music to get people locked into, oh, I get it. This is going to be fun, or this is going to be crazy. Or, you know, and in To Die For, like Beetlejuice, making a statement right out the top helped pull people into, oh, okay, get my mind set into, it's going to be kind of, dark and fun. Now, now that you two have worked together for decades, I'm curious, is that, that template that you set it in, in To Die For, where you score to a couple of scenes, give different versions, is that the way you've continued to work together, or is it different depending on the film? It's pretty close. I mean, it's actually close to the way I work on every film, um, is to start out with a lot of ideas. And I like to put the director as if they're in an optometrist's chair getting an eye exam. And so you can be go, A or B? Okay, now B. Number one or number two? <laughs> and, and you try to like hone in the score from way out here to like something more focused like that. So that's kind of how I imagined myself in the beginning. And that, that presumes that the, the direct, you're really following the director's guidance. Do you, is there a point there where you say, no, really, think about number one? I know you like number two. You think number two looks better, but number one, you give number one another shot. For me? Yeah, is for you. No, I'm indecisive about everything. Um, fa famously, <laughs> Gus and I are kind of similar in this. When we were doing uh, Goodwill Hunting, um, Gus's young assistant, Scott and Hattie or Maddie? Hattie. Hattie, Scott and Hattie. They'd be sitting on the floor behind us. They'd, he'd be in my studio in Topanga Canyon. And they'd just be like sitting, kind of hanging out, talking. And just about every, every cue, I'd play like, one version and the other, and Gus would go, I'm not sure, what do you think? And I'd go, I, I don't know, I can think of just as many reasons why this works as this works. And you start like getting logical about it. You go, well, on the one hand, but on the other hand. And we both get that way. And we turn to Scott and Hattie, go, what do you guys think? And they go, oh, number one. <laughs> I go, they both say the same number every time. And all of those choices made it in the movie. Because <laughs> later, we were sitting there on milk, and we go, oh, where's Scott and Hattie? <laughs> Well, I wanted to ask you about milk because I'm, I'm always really interested in those creative decisions uh, people make that then they abandon it, where they, they change course. They get in pretty deep but do change course. And it sounds like that's a soundtrack where you decided we've been working quite a long time on one approach and it's just not, oh, not going to be in the film. Only once. Milk. Mm -hmm. um, the first thought was opera. You would, because, you know, he listened to opera. And I started writing an operatic score. And I wrote about 12, 14 minutes and... Gus was in his, his first playthrough, remember? It was in Malibu that time, and you were out there. And his face is not the usual kind of like, yeah, it's more worried. And then he goes, you know, I don't think this approach is working. And the idea is that opera sort of reflected you know, Harvey Milk's interest in opera, right. so it made sense in terms of, of the character. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's not uncommon that what one thinks makes sense musically, because I've had this... I think also, like, at that moment it, in Malibu, I remember <clears throat> I wanted to get, make it more weird. Yeah. And I was saying, why can't you do, like, just a Tim Burton score? Well, you no, know, we, we, <laughs> what happened there is there was one short cue that was only about 30 seconds long that I'd done for some other little scene. He said, that one, play that one again. And he said, move that over the titles, move that over here. And he was, then he said, I think that's a better direction. And this little cue became the, now the template for the whole score. Oh, when we were making, we were using um, <clears throat> something that was um, ex very experimental, which was my chance to get more something more weird, yeah. which but, was the oh. um, the beginning cue in the titles. Right. Was what do you call that? I don't. I don't even know. It's where um, <clears throat> Danny has some uh, time left over in the recording session with an expensive orchestra. In and I do weird shit. A lot of times <laughs> in, in England, well, you don't want to use, not use the time because you're paying 
for 10 extra minutes. You finished early. early. So Danny gets up on the podium. I start improvising <laughs> sounds. And has, now what do you tell them? I'll tell them perhaps uh, in this particular case, okay, we're just going to start on a C, but now when we start, I'm going to want half of you to go up, half of you to go down, and half of you to do something else when I signal you. And then I want you all to start moving harmonics, overtones, in a tempo that I'm going to give you. And I said, interpret that any way you like. <laughs> and so, then the musicians start just doing this. And, but sound. some of the musicians, they just put their batons down and go like this. <laughs> like, I'm not doing it. This is not what I... They, they play notes. They don't improvise. Yeah, but a, a lot of them really then got the, into the it. Others do and it. out of that came some <clears throat> sounds. And there was a sound that Gus really liked. He goes, I don't know what that is, but we should make that part of the score. So, but the point is, is that we started with opera as a concept. And so sometimes you do start with a, this is, let's try this, and it just doesn't work. And we literally started from scratch. And none of the operatic or early part of the score made it in the movie. And just logistically, I'm curious, you know, at what point do you become involved in, in a Gus Van Zandt film? Is, is, it, is there a rough assembly? Is that, are you looking at scripts? How, how soon do you start thinking about the music? Well, I don't really start thinking about it until there's a rough assembly. Because he'll send me scripts, but I find if I start thinking in, in the script, it usually leads me astray. Because I'm imagining a movie, and the movie I see is never the movie that's in my head. And how he directs has a lot to do with what kind of score. If he's directing quickly with cuts, or if he's doing slow, and the performances that he's getting, and the cinematography, and is it real lighting, or is it more moody lighting? All of these things are going to indicate a different kind of music. So mm -hmm. what he does with it, when there's a rough cut, I don't need a whole cut, but I can see tonally, oh, OK, I'm getting the feel of it. I could feel it, and it's in that feeling that I'll, I'll get the music. So when I'm reading the script, I try to actually keep myself from mm -hmm. thinking too much about it, because I've gotten misled a number of times. Where I'm imagining a thing in my head, and I actually see the movie, and it's going, it's very different. Mm -hmm. and it could be as simple as the performance is way different than what I was imagining. Or, like I said, the cinematography, lighting, editing, all of these things give it a feel. Mm -hmm. And um, you score differently. I don't know how to explain it. The more theatrically you shoot, as opposed to, what is the word when you're keeping it really real, lighting, uh, natural, and just real? Real, OK. <laughs> it's, it's going to be very different kind of music. The more real you get with the music, you're going to tend to want to get more simplistic and minimal with the music. And then as it gets more theatrical or montage-like, you're really now you're going to open the music up uh, perhaps more. So let's, let's get real specific about this. We've, we've got a treat for you. We've got uh, some original score um, from Don't Worry, He Won't Get Far on Foot. And I, I, I assume most of you weren't able to get into the, see the film yet. Um, so you'll see it soon. It's about John Callahan, who's kind of a local hero in Portland. Um, he's sort of famous for these very darkly comedic cartoons. He was an alcoholic who, after a terrible out drunk driving accident, ends up in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Uh, film stars Joaquin Phoenix, so you'll be seeing him, uh, Jonah Hill, um, and everyone will be saying, as you've never seen him before, I think I've already heard that from 10 people, as uh, his AA sponsor, uh, cast is rounded out with you know, Rooney Mara, Kerry Brownstein, Beth Ditto, really fantastic cast. And it's, um, and it, just as John Callahan kind of has an odd tone to his personality, the film takes that on. So I don't know if you would like to set up um, what we're going to hear now, or if we should just play it. What do you think? Yeah, we could set it up. I mean, it's the... Um uh, the first one will be Out of Reach. Out of Reach. So this is a, um, a, a kind of ma a turning point in our character's um, history as an alcoholic. And uh, uh, it's mostly Joaquin's scene, I think. And uh, it's um, because it was a turning point. We, I had tried all kinds of different things in the temp score. I think I, I was going at sometimes for Lawrence of Arabia, the, the desert walk. Where the uh, the strings were sort of indicating like his um, dehydration <laughs> and I the never sun. Heard the temp score. Oh, right. yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes. Do you, ever hear, do, you, do you normally share a temp score, or do you just keep that aside? Sometimes you will, and sometimes you won't. If if I go to a preview, then I have no choice because the preview is going to have a temp score. Oh, if I go to a preview, sometimes I'll go to a preview before I've started, and then I'm going to hear the temp score. But that's the only time I'm ever going to hear the temp scores if I go to a preview. 
so this one I guess you, you hadn't heard but I tried a lot of different things and I think um, they worked for a while and then they kind of fell apart I like just remember Paco Bell okay. oh Paco Bell was more the, the in, for the whole movie yeah um, canon and D um, but this this is um, well, something we really wanted to that's a good example of how something really changes from beginning to end because in the beginning there was a point where you said maybe we should even license do like variations on Paco Bell's canon right. and I actually thought about that and what we ended up with is so not that <laughs> it's crazy but we took this kind of like with Milk kind of start here mm -hmm. and then we end up and by the end, he's going, oh, try something stranger. Get yeah. something crazier. And then he takes the cues I do and he mixes them up. He, he likes to really play with it, which I'm fine with, with Gus because he's, you know, he's good at that. But, yeah. Well, I guess so we're going to play the audio. We were just going to play the audio first by itself and then play the audio with the scene. Yeah. So we'll do back to back right now. This is a mix that's for the album, so it will definitely. I mean, the the cool the cool thing is like you'll you won't hear it the same way when you see it with the. Yeah, we've never done this. I've never, never done, done this before. This is a first time ever. This this Gus, let's try this. So it's weird. But, I'm hearing my music. But it's, no it's scene. a scene where you don't know um, what the movie is. It's the scene where our, our, our character has been basically locked. He's a quadriplegic. He's basically been locked in the house, and his his daily allotment of alcohol the bottle has fallen under the couch so he can't get it so he I don't think that's in the scene but that's the setup so we'll, we'll play that clip
<laughs> it's really weird doing it this way. <laughs> um, well, I'm curious. I, you know, I was thinking one way to talk about this might be something I've, I've heard you say in interviews before. That, uh, you know, some people talk about scoring a scene, scoring a, a chase, or a plot. They talk about plot in terms of score. And I've often heard you talk about scoring to character, that you're thinking of character more than event. Um, can you maybe, is that a way of talking about this scene and, and this moment in his journey? I don't actually know. Uh, um, you know, I, uh, for this type of movie, I'm not going to write a thematic character theme or something like that. There, there are some themes that repeat in the movie, but it's not following, it's not like his theme. Right. Or, uh, but I don't really think about that other than, you know, um, I'm just looking at the scene and kind of experimenting with sounds. And I have a very limited group to play with, uh, which was kind of the fun part on the score. I only had like a budget for eight musicians, I think. You know, and obviously I'm used to like getting a hundred and something or whatever I want. So, but this was like, you have enough budget, you have enough for eight. So it's like, all right, I'm gonna write a piece for no more than eight people. So, uh, and it's kind of a coincidence, the, the voice that happens in the movie is the sister of Jack Black's wife uh, Petra Hayden, and um, she's doing like kind of odd vocal things. And I used to st uh, stand up bass to do a lot of sounds that we ended up liking. Like with Milk, it was this weird orchestra sound, but here is the sound of a bass. I'm using a lot, just making odd sounds. And that was part of the messing around experiment part. So, so Gus, when you were looking at different versions of this or thinking what you wanted out of the scene score wise, how, how did that evolve? Or how did, were there earlier versions of this that? You weren't as wild about? Uh, from Danny? I don't remember. Not on this scene. Yeah, I think that the, it probably evolved. It, there was a scratch track, which was this same piece, but it was done with um, sampled uh, Strings. instruments. Strings. So it sounded like this, but when you finally record it, it's quite full compared to the scratch track. So there was that, but it probably was just we altered the scene. Um, we added the kind of like panels that fall down. Right. The scene changed at some point. So you probably you altered the score. Well, Did that which happens a lot. The changes. You know, the, originally the the piece was longer, and then it got shorter, and then the kind of montage part in the middle. And there are themes. I think uh, there there are certain themes that repeat that are about like um, an evolution right. of his of his cartooning. Yeah, or a good connects. there's connectivity yeah which any good score if it doesn't have like a character theme but there's still connectivity so his cartooning in the be in the middle of the film connects to him at the end of the film right. and things do connect which i feel real strongly about otherwise it's just a bunch of different pieces of music if you don't connect anything gus i was wondering you know, it's, this is a, f a film in some ways about a man's recovery going through the 12-step process and he, you know, he's a very smart guy he's very self-aware of the cliches and, and the, the like stereotypes around all this kind of therapeutic language, um, he's resistant to it. And I think he says at some point, oh, this is like my epiphany. This is, this is the moment where I'm supposed to have the breakthrough. And in film language, I think, oh, that's the peak. There's gonna be this big emotional peak and it's gonna break and he's gonna be a changed man. Uh, in the film, it, uh, you know, he's, it's clear that there's not one moment. That, uh, does that change <coughs> the way you're building the film in, in, in terms of working the score? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, it changed, and it was a way that it changed in the shooting of the film, because in the in his story, in John Can Callahan's original story and the book, this is leading up to like an epiphany. This is the beginning, and then there's a scene right after this where there is an epiphany that he has. Um, we didn't bring that one down. Do we? Maybe. Anyway, um, it uh, it was a very much a centerpiece of his life. Um, he had this like sort of out of body experience that did uh, in his interpretation in his book um, make him to st make him stop drinking like just on that that moment on the spot and his attendants about to come in and say where's Snickers the rat you know the the mouse um, and uh, you know he announces that you know. He, He's had this epiphany. And it's really right after the scene. It's right after we just the scene. Saw. So it, there is in, in the story there was this in John's life there was this huge epiphany, 
And that became um, only one, you're right. It's like less than one, like there's, there's multiple epiphanies in the movie, which um, I guess was just the, the way it turned out. Well, the character says, I mean, he says, I was expecting this would happen and I'd cry and I'd be totally changed, but I'm still here. And, and, right. and uh, his mentor, uh, what, Donnie, Donnie um, says, it's not like that. You're still going to be the same person and you still have to carry this stuff through your whole life. So that is kind of built in part of the whole story. It's not like this one moment and he feels completely changed. It's a series of things. And the, the epiphany itself is basically just that you know, he was living as a quadriplegic and drinking all day, every day. And, you know, the epiphany was that his problem wasn't his quadriplegia, but, but his drinking. It wasn't like the chair, it was like the bottle. Uh, we, we're, uh, we, we want to get to some questions. Uh, should we maybe for the next clip just do the, the video part? I, I think I'm, I've yeah. run a little bit over. Okay, sure. so we'll, we'll do, we have one more clip and we'll talk about the score in this clip. So we have, um, we'll queue up the next clip, which is the car crash. I mean, one thing I can say about the evolution of Gus and I is each film from To Die For to now, he's gotten much more confident with wanting me to try other kinds of stuff. When we first started, he was very shy. You know, you might say, you know, maybe you should try this or that. And then later, he's like, okay, that's fine, but like, let's find something completely different from another lo location and try it. He really likes to mix things up. And now he's more confident. He'll say, do you mind if we take all the cues you wrote and like, put them in completely different places. <laughs> now, he wouldn't have done that, you know, earlier on, but I'm fine with it, because it actually sometimes makes it more interesting even than what I wrote. <laughs> but he, he's definitely got more confident with wanting to experiment. Sometimes we get into, like, a little argument over it. Um, he challenged me. We got into a thing over a composition he heard in the car on the way over to my studio about... Uh, a composer had written something based on the Higgs boson, the math of a Higgs boson. And I told him, that's bullshit. You know, there's no math of Higgs boson in this thing. It's just a piece of music. And we started arguing about it, and I did an improvisation based on what I insisted was the mathematics of a singularity in a black hole, which I had memorized and, and knew completely. And we finished this crazy improv, and it was actually kind of good. <laughs> and he's like, can we use this? 
And I'm like, no, no, no. In another film, no, why can't we use it? Because we were doing Promised Land. And I was saying, ah, I just don't see how we use this in this movie. I said, it needs a crazy, some kind of scene montage or something dream, a dream sequence or something. And, and so we kind of went up and back a little bit about that. And, uh, but he's so bold, you know, he'll take anything and uh, put it in there. He's more courageous than I am. I tend to be a little more cautious of like, well, I don't want to wreck the tone of the film for the audience either. So part of me is like, yeah, okay, let's do this. Let's go for it. And part of me is like looking at from the overview of like, at what point am I going to tip the audience way off the, the rail and then feel like, oh, I kind of like threw them into a place, but not at a moment where they, because that happens to me when I'm watching films. You know, sometimes I'll hear a piece of music and it like throws me completely out of the film and I, and, and I get really bothered by that. So I keep that in mind, but that's not the, to say that I'm right. It's just, I'm, I'm maybe a few degrees more cautious than you are. Would you agree? Yeah, no, I think, I think you're a safety net for probably for me. <laughs> Because, uh, but on the other hand, he pushes me to try stuff that I wouldn't. So there's definitely a balance. Like I'll, I'll go to this place, and Gus will say, "No, no, do something else there. Do something," and and I like that, yeah. you know. So I, I like being pushed, and then occasionally I'll go, "Whoa, <laughs> uh, let's let's just be cautious here." You know, I try to be that voice of. Well, I know, we, I know a lot of you have questions you'd like to ask. You get bonus points today if you have a question about one of the clips we just watched, because I feel like I want to talk about them more. Um, but we'll pass around a microphone. Please raise your hand if you've got a question, and we'll get one to you. Uh, standing up in the back. Hi. Um, for Danny, uh, I was curious, um, as a composer, the one thing I was hearing is that pe like, composers don't really like when directors give them temp tracks for like inspiration or to copy from or anything like that. So I was just curious as an um, ins inspiring, inspiring director myself, when would that be appropriate, if ever? Well, I mean, sometimes it's helpful if I'd like to, in the best of all worlds, I never hear the temp. Um, and uh, it's becoming more and more impossible to do that because, you know, in the early days, there wasn't the demanding preview, rigorous previews that we have now. You know, To Die For was pretty late in the process. And, but now... But the Tadai 4 is also a period where, you know, that we didn't have computers. To, we couldn't, it was hard to mix stuff t together. Just, it was hard to put music in. So it's either like music or no music. But, but there are times when the director, uh, I'm playing something and he goes, no, but there's a feel of something. And I go, well, let's listen to the temp. What is it that you're responding to? And I can listen to it and go, oh, I see. You're really hearing this tempo. And, and that's moving you, and then I'll have to pay attention to that. But there's a tempo or something, and I go, yeah, I could see that. Why you'd, you know, I'm writing something much slower, you're feeling something more aggressive, or with an ostinato with a repeating pattern. And so there is times when it's useful, but for me, it, it's like 85% damaging, harmful, and 15% useful, because m half of my job, not with Gus, but with other directors, is getting them off of their temp is really half the job. Writing the score is only half of it. Like going through the slow process of peeling them away from what they've been hearing for six months um, is incredibly difficult. And I feel sorry for them because they've been hearing it or on an animated feature. They, they could be, have been hearing it for over a year. And uh, I'd hate to be in that position where I've been hearing something for a long time and then suddenly I'm not. Gus, he, he's more the anomaly. He doesn't get attached to stuff. So. I don't ever remember a time we said, listen to this temp, I really love what it's doing, can you do something like that? Because I've been through that many times, but that's one of the reasons I love working with Gus. He doesn't seem to get real attached to the temp scores. Try another question? Over here? Uh, we'll get you a mic first, hold on a second. Is that true, that what I just said? Remind yeah. me that up. <clears throat> well, um, I don't get attached because you, like, I think make it clear that you don't want to hear the tips. <laughs> uh, see so how, it, like, I change the narrative to kind of fit my own point of view. Um, that has probably to do with a lot of no, my I, memories. I agree in with general. the concept of like it's going to be better if you don't 
if you aren't influenced by the temp score, I, th I find that a good idea, you know. Uh, you had a question? So using that clip actually as a jumping point, and there's questions for Gus, I think Danny touched on really nicely on the evolution of you as a filmmaker working with you over the years. So kind of based on that clip, what are ways in which Danny's evolved for you and how does he continue to surprise you? How, how Danny has evolved? Yeah, as, I mean, as a collaborator, he kind of spoke a bit about you started off maybe a bit more shy, have grown in confidence. What are ways in which approaching a conversation with him now when you make a film, maybe that he continues right. to... I think I th one of the things that happens, I think, is, um, and between, t even on To Die For, when we first spoke about the score for To Die For, it was really an, a, an attempt session. You wanted to know, not, he didn't, Danny didn't want to hear the temp necessarily, but he wanted to know where it starts and where it ends. Which well, it was a spotting session. Yeah. And which have never done a spotting session. Yeah, I'd never really done that. I thought maybe the composer just decided where the music would go. Yeah, but I, I'm used to a thing called a spotting session where you sit with the editor and you go through every cue and you talk about music should start here, it should play through here, and it should kind of come out here. Right. And then we give it a name and a number. It gets like 1M1, 1M2, 1M3, and there's like the list that comes from the spotting session. Gus right. was like, I don't do that. <laughs> and the, you know, my editor, Curtis Clayton, was quite used to that. <clears throat> I think one of the things that had happened... Before to die for my own private Idaho, <clears throat> um, I decided to just do the score myself, in the sense that I used um, uh, public domain songs like "America the Beautiful" or the um, national anthem, and <clears throat> as the or "Home on the Range." These were things that were in public domain, and had musicians come in in a recording studio and play to the picture. There was a spotting, you know, it was like start here and there. <clears throat> and this infuriated my editor. He said, this is not the way, you, like what are you doing? <laughs> this is not the way you do it. Um, and I, but I had something very clear in my head like that would work and we brought in a pedal steel and a, a musical saw and all this stuff and it became fine. So I, I had done it, you know, that way. Uh, Elliot um, Goldenthal had done Drugstore Cowboy he had done that just sort of in his New York apartment and just sent us the score. So I sort of had a rudimentary understanding by To Die For of like how it worked. Um, but then the spotting session was kind of new for me, like literally because I... Because that was more of a formal thing and with an actual list and a breakdown. And that's just because that's where I had been brought up to do. So, but on the other hand, I would love to do something the way Gus is describing. We just go in the studio with musicians yeah, and with just, a, some just fake themes. Start winging it, basically. Start winging it. I've um, only done that once my whole life. It was a, a movie called Freeway. And um, I had like three, four guys sketched out a few ideas, had nothing written down, really, and we just winged it like you're describing. It, it, it was, was really cool. fun. Another but question? Uh, right over here. We'll get you a mic. Hold on a second. We should do that sometime. I think we've got just about five minutes left. Um, this one's for Danny. I was uh, interested recently by the decision to bring back um, the classic John Williams score and your previous score um, in the Justice League movie, and I was wondering, based on that, how you decide to write these character themes, whether it, it is based on the fundamentals of a character or based on the interpretation uh, specific to that movie. Well, it, it's just a totally different medium. You know, when you're writing for a milk or Don't Worry, You Won't Get Far on Foot or To Die For, you're not writing character themes. You're writing tonal themes that follow the story, as Gus is describing. We're connecting, here's three moments, and we want to connect those three moments. Whereas in a, a, a superhero uh, genre, you're literally giving a theme to each character. Batman has a theme. Superman as a theme. I just loved the Superman theme, so I begged to bring back John Williams. I convinced them at DC that they've got this incredible wealth. They've got these gems. They should use them. They should be proud of them. And, um, but it's just very different. That, in that genre, everybody gets a theme. And so that was kind of defined by Star Wars, which goes back to 
corn gold before Star Wars, back to the 40s and 50s, where you've got the good guy theme, you've got the bad guy theme, you've got the love theme, you've got every theme is really cleanly defined. That's classic film scoring circa 1940, 50s uh, from the golden era, and most superhero films still essentially follow that template of, you know, your evil guy is going to have your evil theme. Your Darth Vader walks in, he's got a Darth Vader theme. Uh, whereas in a drama, that gets really corny really fast. And so the, my feel for writing themes at all, like, you know, I'm really fond of the milk theme, you know, the theme, what I call the milk theme, you might not even hear as the theme to milk. It's what I call the milk theme, but it's not necessarily Harvey Milk's theme. It's just a theme that I feel plays the heart, the feeling of the movie. So it's not connected to any character, it's just the feeling of Harvey that, and we used it three, four times so it connects elements, it ends the movie with it. And so it's thematic, but it's not like Harvey walks on screen and Harvey's theme plays. It's just more about wanting to get a feeling that connects, carries through. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, over here, we'll get you a microphone. Probably five more minutes. Okay. Do I do two? Hi. Uh, this question is for Gas. Sorry for my English. But um, every time I have the same question when I watch your movies, um, in my opinion, the music is really strong and the acting is really strong. So I used to wonder. Uh, if the actor follow the music or the music follow the uh, acting. Um, so I was wondering if the in rehearsal process, the actor have the opportunity to listen to music to get some influence for the, the color and the rhythm um, to choose the way to act. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. uh, I have never actually had music before during the shooting, uh, that I would play any of the characters, I don't think. Um, I know in the only movie that I had something in mind was Good Will Hunting, because it was set in Harvard, and um, it had a feeling of um, of something that I, I had seen other movies do, where like they take um, a musician and they play a number of his of his pieces, in, in particular. Uh, I guess The Graduate, um, and Simon and Garfunkel. Elliot Smith, to me, sounded like Simon and Garfunkel, although I was told when I met Elliot, don't mention Simon and Garfunkel. Um, <laughs> but he had, there was sort of something to it, and I, I, I was into that. I, I'm sure I, I'm, I didn't play the actors that score. I gave, it to, I gave that uh, Elliot's music to the editor. Um, in the original screenplay, it indicated... Uh, that the score was uh, world music, that it was going around w different types of music from around the world as part of its score, and we tried that, and the editor was trying that, and I just said, like, like scrap it, like, use Elliot. Um, that's, that's the closest I came. I think other filmmakers sometimes actually create a score. Have you ever worked that way, Danny? Like, well, um, I've never done a score that was played for the actors, because by the time I'm on a film, the actors are generally gone. Um, just to answer your question, usually by the time I start, the actors are already off on another film. I'm lucky to even meet them. But, but there is moments where directors will play something specific for an actor. Yeah. I mean, historically, the most famous would be Sergio Leone. Sergio Leone, um, he would get the music in advance and he would play, them, play it on the set as if it were an oh. opera. But these are very operatic pieces and he needed an operatic piece built and then he would work around it. Uh, directors like Kubrick would build entire scenes around a piece of music, but he would find a pre-existing piece of music that was already recorded. And I've often called The Shining a perfectly scored film, and there's no original music at all. Uh, but he would take a piece of music that he loved, and he would start cutting minutes before where the climax of the piece of music is getting to and build it right up to the tennis ball hitting the wall perfectly scored, but he, he did that to the music. So the actors weren't hearing it, but he had it in his head, I'm going to use this. But that's kind of rare. Yeah. And I'm getting into history now. And so. I think sometimes um, the actors will have music that they like, that they play when they're 
you know, rehearsing their own pieces or uh, learning their lines. So they independently have something that they're playing for themselves that I never end up hearing unless they give me the... And I never end up hearing. But that, so it's separated. There is music thing. around, but it's not necessarily the music that ends up in the, in the movie. Although um, when we did Jerry, which was a film I brought to Sundance, um, the music that was in that movie, and particularly Arvo Part, was music that we were playing when we were driving across Argentina on the way to a desert where we were shooting the first part of the movie with um, Casey Affleck and Matt Damon and myself in the car that they drove we were just decided to do this road trip as a way to get across the country. And we were playing, I mean, Casey had the CDs with him and he was playing Arvo Part and um, a few other, uh, um, some folk musicians that weren't in the, the score, but Arvo like stood out, it started to become like the sound of our adventure and the sound of the movie. But so that's, that, it's like the Kubrick thing. So yeah. the piece of music actually indicated how you were going to put the sequence together because you had that already in your head and uh, like like Stanley would yeah and then when we when I used it in the edit you know it just worked perfectly partly because the whole thing had revolved around these um, records that we were playing when we were making the movie everybody I'm going to ask you to stay in your seats for just a second these guys have got to get going really quickly and they're going to head out the doors if you mind just staying we have here one last last question you, yeah we'll do one one hey, last question That's de we're demanding one last question we'll do it um, here on the aisle right here we'll get her I'm sorry I love question and answers it's my favorite <laughs> thank you uh, my question is for Gus about the car crash scene um, in your movie it was a really amazing and interesting choice not to show the accident. It really kept us focused on the character's experience opposed to relating our own experience to a car crash. So I'm wondering how that came about. Was it written that way? Did you already have it in your head? Was it a budget saver? Because you didn't have to have an accident. Um, just kind of curious how you got there. There was an image that followed a cartoon that you could see uh, uh, the aftermath of the car crash in the film. So you only, that's the only, you saw the aftermath and you saw beforehand. And we did um, continue the shot all, all the way up until the crash. And we, we made a crash <clears throat> um, uh, with special effects. We had fire and we had uh, a pole and so forth that it ran into. And somehow, before we finished the edit, we realized that we didn't need to finish that special effect because it was better to not see it because it was so, yeah. Which is also musically how we approach this. Like not to give anything in the music that says we're about to crash. It's actually very calm. And to me, watching that the first time, what I loved about it, I was really happy they didn't show the crashes. It becomes his experience. You know, if you've ever been in a catastrophic thing, you don't remember the catastrophic thing. You remember falling asleep, and then next thing you know, you're in the hospital. And that's exactly how it feels, which I thought was beautiful. Um, that there's no big moment. It's just, and it happened. It changed my life forever. I, I love that. It's one of my favorite moments in, in the movie. Uh, thank you two so much. Good, we really appreciate you coming. And if everyone could just stay in your seats for just a little bit. Thank you very much. <laughs>